Welcome back, Duke fans. Uh, we're here with another episode of the Brotherhood Podcast. Um, today, we have uh, an incredible guest here with us, one of our biggest supporters uh, of Duke basketball, uh, a native to the state of North Carolina, uh, and has been around Durham for a long time. Ninth Wonder here with me, um, and super excited to have you in today. We also have Jeremy Roach here, who um, is, uh, I guess, our team music guy, uh, making a lot of beats, and has obviously done some work uh, on the side through through Duke Independent Studies with Ninth. So, um, real exciting conversation today. Hopefully, we can talk about um, all things about your life, your background here, and in, in the state of North Carolina, your time in Durham, uh, obviously your incredibly successful career in the music industry, and then, uh, of course, touch a little bit upon um, your your fan of fandom of our program and, and Duke basketball in general. But cool. uh, before we get into it, I had to ask, how was the uh, how was the U.S. Open oh, there last God. week? Uh, I saw it on your Instagram. That must have been a pretty cool experience. Man, it was a thing that I discovered that, you know, just on a racial standpoint, not believing or thinking that a lot of African Americans just attended the U.S. Open, although it's named after an African American. And it has this kind of fever like the Kentucky Derby has. The, K the Kentucky Derby has this, like, this underlining thing where a lot of African Americans go, they have a good time, they whatever. And so that's what I saw at the U.S. Open. I mean, I only, only spent six hours there DJing, but that's what I saw. You know, you can pay a fee just to get in and just walk the grounds, and I'm, just, I'm going next year pretty much uh, just because of that. How cool. Did you get to see Coco Golf win? No, I was there um, – while she was playing, but not the match from the other night. So um, I didn't get to see that. Um, so, but still, just the fact, again, that just this whole culture of the U.S. Open that exists that people really don't know about unless you go. You know what I mean? And and so that's what made it dope for me to go up there and oh, DJ. That's incredible. And then you just, you mentioned it before we got on. You have class tomorrow. You're teaching a class here at Duke this semester and uh, NCCU? Well, I'm teaching at three schools this semester. I'm okay. teaching at Duke. Um, Wake Forest and Elizabeth City State. And um, this is my 12th year at Duke teaching. Wow. So I've been here since the, the hired in 2010, been here since the spring of 2011. So just, just imagine the number of basketball players I've seen come yeah. through this place. And it's been in my classroom. Sometimes yeah. I've had two, sometimes I've had whole starting lineups in my classroom. <laughs> but, um, it's been an incredible ride for the last 12, 13 years being here. Yeah. So obviously, you're like I said before, you're one of the, be in my opinion, you're one of the best producers out, uh, one of the top producers ever. Uh, you worked with Kanye, Beyonce, Kendrick, some of the top uh, artists. Uh, what makes artists so special? Like, what makes them, like, what goes into the work? Like, what makes them so good? The great artists study sports because the work that's put into sports as far as muscle memory, repetition, just over and over and over. Like when we came to sit down, Jeremy asked me how many beats did I make today? It's asking me how many jumpers did I shoot today after practice? It's exactly what it is. And the thing that ties us together, and, and, and G said this one time when he came, Grant Hill said this when he came to the studio one time, he said, man, it's like, I, I watch you because you're a master of your craft the same reason why you come and watch basketball players. Any basketball player that's the master of their craft is like maniacal about it. They just mm -hmm. over and over, same move, same move, same move, same move. And it's like chasing the most incredible high ever. Like you never, it never gets old to see that ball go through that hoop. That's that's called the love of the game. And amongst, I mean, amidst money, amidst fame, whatever, you can tell the ones in the NBA who, or in college, who is doing this for the lifestyle and who's doing it for the love of the game. Yeah. Music is the same thing. Jay-Z is one of those ones that he does it for the love of the game. Although he has millions and billions and billions, he still believes in the fine art of emceeing and lyricism. And you can tell some mm -hmm. of the things that he says in rhyme. Same thing with Nas, same thing with the greats that we have. No matter how much money they make, you can tell that they still love to write rhymes and to just be, I'm going to try to be as best as I can every day. And the emceeing is not something you retire from. Like you can rhyme to your 70, yeah. right, if you wanted to. This would be the first time there would be a chance to see it. But still... 
for the ones that play basketball and leave the game. And I mean, we just had somebody retire from here that's been here since I was five, yeah. right? And no matter how much he's accomplished, no matter whatever, like the synergy between a Coach K and a Jay-Z is because they both love the game. No matter the accolades, they both love the craft. And that's the one thing that joins music and basketball together. It's the continuous practice, 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 practice. We won a game. Okay, we beat Carolina. Okay, we swept Carolina. On to the next. It's like, what's the next thing we can get to? Some people revel in the moment. Some people sit there. But the great ones, they do something. They do a thing, and it's dope. And then they get the accolades from it, and they're, yeah. I'm thinking next. That's what makes the greats great. Follow up for you there, and mm -hmm. I can't remember what your take out is on this term, but Merck Mitchell has a quote when you talk about athletes to musicians comparison. What Mark says that Drake is the LeBron of music. Yeah, he loves Drake. What do you, what do you think about that? What, about that Mark Mitchell yeah, take? What yeah. is happening? <laughs> what? I'm, I remember you talking about that in, in class. Uh, he said that he said the same thing. You kind of went on a little, <laughs> a little slip <laughs> there. Okay, 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 okay. Um. To some generations, Drake is the GOAT. Mm -hmm. To some generations, LeBron is the GOAT, right? But I think the thing that joins LeBron and Drake together is Drake has done something as an artist and taken places. His artistry has taken him places that a lot of artists even not even thought it was you can do that was believable, it was attainable. He's done it over and over and over and over and over. And he's broken barriers that most artists couldn't break. Same thing with LeBron. The most remarkable thing I think about LeBron is, of course, the scoring record and the things he's done in the finals and won championships. But it's able to be able to play by your own rules, to become your own GM, yeah. to say, I don't want to play for y'all anymore. I'm going to play with somebody else. There's nothing you can do about it but pay me. Like that kind of... That kind of freedom, MJ didn't have that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that kind of freedom MJ didn't have to say, okay, Jerry Krause, I don't play. Can you get Barkley in here and can you get Bird? He didn't have that kind of freedom to do so. He had to take what he had and he had to work with what he had. LeBron, on the other hand, had a chance to not only have that kind of freedom, but do it in the midst of his own team, Maverick Carter, Richard Paul, yeah, like – there's been no other player in history like that. They've we've all had our you know, homies to hang around, but not Rich Paul having his own agency, Maverick doing the bar and all the other stuff Maverick has done, speaking commencement speeches at universities and like LeBron has done that. So I think the barrier breaking that LeBron and Drake has done is synonymous with each other. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Just want to get your take on that because it's talked a lot about how when Mark brings it up in the locker room. So Yeah, no, Mark loves yeah. <laughs> It's the Drake-Michael Jackson thing with Mark I don't understand, but that's another class. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you speak more? I, I know you're from uh, outside you know, uh, in Winston-Salem, correct? Mm -hmm. But you've spent a lot of time in Durham. Can you just talk about what Durham means to you and kind of, I guess, how you've seen it change over the years? You know... We call places our hometown, Winston-Salem or Midway, North Carolina, is where I'm from. Okay. It's, you know, my hometown, but then you, ended, you end up spending more time in the place you move to than actually your hometown. So I've only spent 18 years in my hometown when I graduated from high school. When I came here, I've been in the Raleigh-Durham area now for 30 years. This is my 30th year being here. This is unbelievable. I graduated in 1993, so August of 93, I was at North Carolina Central as a freshman. And so... Now, this is September of 2023, so I've been here for 30 years. Just watching the change of Durham and how it's changed over the years, how Duke has changed over yeah. the last 30 years. It's amazing. So, but that's, um, Durham means a lot to me in that way because it kind of, Raleigh Durham raised me more than, Interesting. yeah, yeah. hometown did. Yeah, I wanted to touch on that just because that was, it seems to be a shell shock to everybody that I speak to. And uh, I know Durham just moved off campus too, but I live in the downtown Durham area, like right next to the Bulls Stadium. And it's awesome. But there's so many people that I tell that to that have been, you know, at Duke for a long time. And everybody seems to say the same thing, that it's just such a drastic change even from whatever, 10, 
years ago. Obviously, you saw it when it was 20 years ago, but people talk about it like it's they've done so much work there. Um, so interested to hear your take on that. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the side of the spectrum you're looking at. Of course, from the looks of it and the optics of it, it's very nice. I mean, the downtown, there were times you couldn't even walk through downtown, right, safely, mm-hmm. right? But now, you know, because of things have changed, downtown is, is, a, is a different place. Uh, Durham has always been a big city of the arts. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at one time it hosted the most black millionaires in the country. But now, you know, the, the ugly word is, is gentrification, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but at the same time, still, you know, it changed the face of downtown. It's bringing a lot of businesses downtown, whether, you know, whoever owns the business, you can... It just looks like a, diff, a totally different place now. Like I've I've watched the old Durham Bulls stadium, but now the new one, right? So it's um definitely dope that you you live in that area. It's more it seems like it's more metropolitan that way. Do you think it's losing that side of its art artistical side when you say it like that? No, I mean as long as there's still space for it, yeah. as long as we can still have festivals and still showcase our art, I think that's really dope. As long as we don't lose that, I think over time you're gonna face where everything changes as far as property value and going up and down, you know, how this country is. So, but still, as long as we can keep that aesthetic, yeah. that's what's really important. And going off the, the art side of things, um, can you speak about the musical influence in the Raleigh Durham area? Um, I know it's not, I guess, I correct me if I'm wrong, like it's not a huge prevalent area for that. So, you know, I wouldn't say. You wouldn't say well. I mean, go ahead. He, <laughs> I mean, he, he might he yeah. might he might know more than me. Well, it's, it's like. the it's the the part that the people miss about Raleigh Durham, especially North Carolina. Period is the fans and support system. Yep. Has it put out a ton of artists that has made it out of North Carolina in general? Nah, I mean, if you look across the board in music, we put out a, a great deal in hip hop. Uh, not so much. Not as far as in New York and L.A. and in Atlanta and Chicago. But as far as fans, historically, North Carolina and South Carolina has sold the most records in hip-hop history wow. because of the colleges. Yeah. Um, if you look at this area, it's 10 schools. If you include the technical school, you know, community colleges, the ACC schools, the HBCUs, the, girl, you know, the, the women's colleges, it's 11 schools. So now if you are a budding artist, you have a built-in fan base that you can litmus test from. Yeah. Right. If I'm if I'm an artist, I can go from here to Chapel Hill, Tennessee State, to any school to do a show. It's not that many places in the country that has that kind of close knit university system like the Raleigh Durham area has. And so that's been our the thing that we've won at the most. If you wanna be an artist and you wanna succeed, especially on the road, you'd have to come through North Carolina, because all the schools are here. Yeah, yeah. Is is that you, you spoke about the college and the schools, and obviously you've been back here teaching and, and professing for yeah. some time now. Is that what brought you back? What is that? Some, was that something you always were kind of interested in? How did you come back and decide on becoming a professor? You know, I was I was asked to do so. I was I was going around. Um, you know, me leaving Winston Salem. Now a lot of us came from Winston Salem to come to school here. Some of us become teachers. I was supposed to become a teacher. I was a history uh, history major. And then, so my friends that became teachers, now they have this famous friend that does music, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And so now they want me to come by and talk to their students. And I did that. And at the time, the chancellor of North Carolina Central called went to it and asked me to come be a university professor. And this is 2006. And then after that... Um, Mark, Dr. Mark Anthony Neal, who is now the chair of the mm-hmm. African American Studies Department, asked me to be a professor here, and that was, I was like, wow, you know. Yeah. And so I've been from here to do, I mean, from Central to do to Harvard to everywhere else I've taught, you know, this has kind of been the mainstay for me. I've been here the longest. Yeah. So. And what about professing? Do you and teaching? Do you enjoy? Is it is it kind of what you imagined? Is there anything that Super different than what you pictured. No, well, um, my mom was a um, educator for forty six years before okay. she retired. So, the engagement of the next generation is what I get out of it the most. A lot of people my age refuse to engage with the next generation mm-hmm. outside of coaching or teaching, mm-hmm. right? And so, for me, 
especially in the music business and the music, the culture of music, if I want to understand where everything is going, I cannot. I have to talk to an 18 year old or 19 year old to get their perspective of how they buy music, how they receive it. And a lot of us our age, they don't do enough listening instead of talking. So if you're in my classes, I always, my class is not, I lecture, you shut up. That's not what it is. My class is I lecture, you talk, I talk, you talk, I talk. So we can kind of get yeah. some common ground. So I get a lot of it like that. And it's a changing atmosphere every year. You, A kid from 2023 is not the same kid in 2016 now. Yeah. And so I get an updated, it's like an iOS, <laughs> like an updated <laughs> iOS every year of how the next generation of kids are thinking. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I enjoy that. Yeah. So it's interesting you say that. Uh, I mentioned it earlier because we have Jeremy here um, who's super into making beats. We have our resident 18, 19 year old that, that uh, you can learn from. I guess he failed my class, by the way. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I guess you're not 18. You're old now, man. What are you, 21? 21. Wow. Uh, but Jeremy, can you speak? I know you've obviously you've taken nine's class. You know, what got you interested in making beats in the first place? How'd that start? Uh, so my brother makes beats yep. and it was off season. It was like May. I was about to go back to school and I was just bored. I was just bored at the crib and him. Like, I've always been a fan of music. I've grew up, grew up playing the drums. My dad plays the drums. Uh, he's in a jazz band. My sister was, uh, played the sax. My brother played the sax. Brother, they both played guitar. So I like just grew up with a music, a musical background. And I was like, yeah, I, I love beats. Like it seems kind of easy uh, and I'm bored. I need some, I need something else to do. Like, so I started trying to make beats and I mean, obviously, uh, Ninth is a uh, one of the top producers pretty much ever. I mean, he's worked with the best, so um, fell in love with it and uh, kind of just kept it rolling ever since. Yeah, and, and can you go back into that? Uh, as Ninth said, you know, he's taught so many just of our guys, but overall Duke students. What stands out and draws so many guys like you to to take his class and and to try and seek his guidance in making music? I mean, one, he's cool, like one of the coolest dudes I, I didn't met here. So, I mean, <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, so it just makes it that much easier when you kind of like, I mean, showing him some music, I've sent, I've sent him stuff and it's like, just makes, it makes it so much comfortable um, and give you feedback and stuff like that. I mean, and he's always honest. He's never going to like downgrade. He's always going to try to give you game. Uh, always going to try to just do what's, what's best for you. So, I mean, that's why I just, every, I think that's why everybody falls in love with, with Nike. Yeah. And then I think you mentioned that you've taken, uh, you've taught a ton of our guys. I, I won't ask, and I'm sure a lot of them that are into music. I won't ask who the worst student you've had that's been on the program on the team. <laughs> I'll ask you who the best has been. Hopefully, it's hopefully Germs the running for that. But uh, out of all the guys you've taught, has there been a a star in the classroom? Hmm. The best. Uh, let me start here. Let's go with the best rappers and the worst rappers. Let's okay. Yeah. Uh, the worst rapper. <laughs> you know, it's funny. One night, um, the guys by the came by the studio. This is 2013, fall of 2013. <laughs> and they left uh, a Lil Wayne concert. And so Jabari hits me and says, I'm, I want to come to the studio. I'm like, okay, who you with? And it was him, Emil, Matt Jones, and at the time, Rashid Suleiman. And um, so I immediately called Cable at the time as I looked. Guys come by to my studio, but letting you know they come by. He's like, all right, cool. So they came by the studio and they decided they want to do a rap song. <laughs> One of the worst songs ever made, man. It was it was horrible. Uh, but but we had fun though. We had fun. So I'm pretty sure they're gonna watch it. It's like, oh man, it's messed up. It was bad. It was really bad. Um, um the best rapper that I had here, um, arguably one of the best rappers I've heard to pick up a pen that played basketball was Marvin Bagley. Oh, like, oh, I didn't even know he rapped. Oh God. Um, freestyle off the top. Like, I played a beat for like 30 seconds. He's like, oh, I'm ready to go. And wow. he rap for out like minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes. Change the beat, rap for minutes, minutes and minutes. So to the point, and one, one time Duke was playing, Vitale mentioned it during the game. Hmm. He was just recently in the studio with the, Big time producer. I'm like, say my name, dude. Come on, say my name, man. Come on. I think I might have um, to be. <laughs> but, uh, be for real. but yeah, you know. But as far as students is concerned, I can't necessarily say I had the a bad student because, like yeah. Jeremy said, every student that's sitting in my class, they're engaged. But let's start with every time a, the Duke players are in my class, they sit in the front. Yeah. I make them sit in the front. 
like mm. right in front of me, everybody together. Like they try to come in and sit in the back because I teach in white lecture halls, so they like to sit in the back. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, but it's funny because um, Zion Williamson, right? He turned his paper in the night before. Like he said, he he, he kept hitting me. He said, "Man, I'm gonna get you my paper. I'm gonna get you my paper. I'm gonna get you my paper." And he turned his paper in either I can't remember the night before the draft or the night of. Wow. Like to keep his promise, yeah. like because they know I, I'm. You know, you play for the team. It's demanding. I get that. I want my paper, bro. <laughs> like I want my paper. So I can honestly say. Even past when they leave here, it's always a mutual respect because they know how much I care about the culture and they know how much I care about learning. It, the grade is not that important to me. It's about learning. I want you to learn and take something with you. Right. Yeah. So I can't say I had any bad students. Yeah. I, I can say everybody's been different. Um, Mark is real, real engaging. Like he's always, you know, even if he's not saying anything, he's just, you know, always looking. I can walk back and forth campus. I mean, class, and he's turning around. Harry was a great student. Yeah. Like it's just all across the board. I've had him, like I said, since 2011. So that's everybody from Miles Plumley, Seth Curry, all the way until last year. So oh. it's been always a dope response. And the yeah. basketball players that I've had. Oh, that's awesome. I, th I think it's, I'm sure it's a testament to, to you as a professor because we've all sat in classrooms here and um, a, a big part of it, you know, f being passionate and engaged about the topic as a student, a lot of it comes from seeing the professor being passionate uh, about it as well. So um, got to give you, you a ton of credit there. The last question I had about teaching, uh, we touched on it earlier with the U.S. Open, but uh, you graduated now teach at, at Central University. It's a notable HBCU. Mm -hmm. You know, can you just talk about what kind of pride you take in being a part of that community and how, um, you know, obviously just following on Instagram, I see how prevalent it is uh, for you and how much pride you take in. What's it mean to be a professor there? Oh, man. Um, when I was at North Carolina Central, it was kind of, it was crazy to me because I was a student and at the same time, now I'm a professor. So I always start. I was always start the class with saying, "I was just in this seat yeah. twenty five years ago, twenty years ago, right?" So that's an ultimate connection to that, right? I can all. I can, you can get to the students very fast by saying, "I was, I was once you." So if you ever know, want to know what you could be in the next twenty, me. Although I didn't graduate from college, right? And and that's a big thing too. Not to say that you shouldn't graduate, but to know that I've been in that community, HBCU community, which is, I think North Carolina is like third of the most HBCUs in the country, I think after Alabama and Georgia. Huh. And so um, I grew up in it. I'm from Winston-Salem. Winston-Salem State was right up the street. A&T is right close, been in college, John C. Smith down the street. So at first I didn't even, as a kid, I didn't even look at it as a black college. I looked at it as college. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely a huge part of of our community and how it ties into Duke is Duke funds or partially funds Johnson C. Smith has been doing it for almost the last almost 100 years now. Um, had a very close relationship with North Carolina Central, the founder of North Carolina Central and, you know, Black Wall Street. And so that's, you know, people always ask me, why do I like do basketball? And I, that's part of it. It's not just because of the jersey. It's the history behind the jersey. It's history behind the school. So I, I understand this connection to Black Wall Street. I understand how to help the North Carolina Central. There's a there's a camp uh, building on campus called B and Duke Auditorium. That was one of Washington Duke's sons. Yeah. And that came because they were beneficiary, like gave money to the school to start, right? So um, it's a lot of history there, but just to be a part of the HBCU community has always been a thing for me. And then the tied into hip hop in the early nineties and, yeah. and still, and still love it. Absolutely. Um, and we were going to touch on that, uh, moving into your, you know, being a Duke basketball fan, you talked about, um, you know, how you became a, a fan just now. How has the perception of Duke basketball <laughs> evolved in the state in general and Ooh. locally over time? You know, I've been, I remember the moment I became a, fan. Uh, my friends and I snuck on campus 
to watch the 1994 championship against Arkansas. And we came from North Carolina Central. We said, we're going to get over here early because, you know, they shut down the campus at a certain time. So we watched it in the Bryan Center on a small TV. And to watch, if you know that tournament, to just to watch what Grant Hill did during that tournament, like never expecting them to go that far, defeated Big Dog. Like it was crazy, Glenn Robinson, to get to that championship. And it was just a, a missed Antonio Lane block. That's why they lost that game. And that became like, okay, I understand what leadership looks like. Not from only Coach K, but Grant. I understand what unity looks like, together looks like. This is what this is. And if I'm going to carry this stuff on, if I eventually come something else, I can carry that on. Now, before that, and to be honest, like I'm, I'm a kid of the 80s. I've just followed any team with a bunch of black players. Georgetown, which you look at Georgetown as far as TBO, PWI is concerned, it's a whiter school than Duke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right? But it didn't look like that, right, in the 80s. Very prevalent in hip hop. Then I started following Clemson. Clemson had a, you know, a crazy team. Eldon Campbell, Dale Davis, like this crazy team in the, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. And then, of course, UNLV, right? Yeah. Um, and then Duke beats UNLV. And then after that, it became the Fab Five. So I'm just, you know, right? Because I'm really in the NBA basketball at that time. But it wasn't until I saw that 94 game, I was like, yeah, like this is something different for me. Now I'm understanding it's becoming more than just X's and O's. It's becoming more of some more. So following since then, <clears throat> fast forward all the way to 2010, I'm on Twitter one night. And I'm watching the Sugar Shane Mosley fight. And I tweeted something about the fight, and Grant Hill tweets back. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> this is a guy I saw at parties when we were in school together. Like, he yeah. was here at Duke. I was at Central. He's come over. He tweets me back, and I damned him. And I was like, what's up, man? <laughs> and he said, hey, man, what's up, man? I, you know, just want to say what's up. I'm a fan. Like, what? And I was like, man, I've been a fan. Like, you know. <laughs> So we started talking. So he said, I want to come by the studio sometime. So he came by the studio. And then the next person he bought after that was Jeff Capel. Then he came with Capel and Antonio, uh, um, um, Trajan Langdon. Then they brought Reggie Love. It just became like a, I was bringing people by the studio. Then they brought somebody I can't even remember. And so then one thing led to another. For me going to uh, speak at uh, Marquette when Wojo was at Marquette. He brought me up to speak. Carowell was up there at the same time. So I met Carowell then. Um, I went to school at Central with Carowell's wife. We went to Central together. And so Capel said, it comes, to, it comes to practice. The person, if you notice, I haven't met yet was Kay. Um, Capel says, come to practice, man. Okay. So I come to practice. This is the fall of 2014. And I'm walking in, and I walk up, and... He said, once you meet Coach K, okay. So I walk up to meet him, and the first thing that comes out of Coach K's mouth is, you're going to just go around and speak all these other schools and not talk to my guys? Wow, that's the first thing you're going to say. Like, <laughs> but from that, that was crazy because Duke ended up winning in that season. Yeah. And that's where my relationship with the team outside of the classroom began. Me teaching here in 2010, I never thought I'd be close to the program. I just thought I'd teach the kids. Mm -hmm. But meeting Kay and then meeting, slowly meeting every player after that, whether they played for the school present day, beforehand, it would be over time I would just meet yeah. over time. And probably the first recruit that I met here that I became very close with, still very close, is Jabari. Yeah. And that's how it's been since. So been a fan for a very long time. Still, I still am. But now it's a little bit deeper for me at this point. And that's how it's been for the last mm, almost 10 years now. Yeah. So I've watched the assistant coaches that's been here. I watched John go from one point to where he is now, right? So it's kind of watching this program grow up in so many ways and become the number one college not basketball program, but the number one college brand on yeah. the planet. 
people don't like when we say that. <laughs> it's a fact. Um, and not one, no one college brand on the, the planet becoming more progressive as far as racial matters. For K to, to do that um, speech during the George Floyd situation was was crazy. And he, I don't think people really understand the magnitude. He did it with a Duke background with the USA basketball shirt on. Like, it was all intentional, yeah. right? And the first thing he says, Black Lives Matter. And then he, you know, the shirts were made, the jerseys were made. Like, it was amazing. So just to watch how the program has switched from being a, oh, you like white boys at Duke, because, you know, Leitner was the face, and Ferry was the face, and Hurley was the face, and J.J. Reddick. But now it's become something else. Now it's become the Duke starting five haircut from 2015 <laughs> yeah. to just a different look of this program. To the branding, there's only two college programs that has a nickname for their it's the you and the brotherhood. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, people like to say the whatever, make up other stuff what they say, but it's not. Yeah, no. You know? It's not authentic. Yeah. It's not authentic. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, you know, the people, recruits come here now and they say, I, I'm joining the brotherhood. They don't yeah. even say I'm going to Duke University. You, you know, it's yeah. not. So it's just become just global, whether K being part of USA Basketball, Whatever it is, it's become a global thing now. And now people hate to hear this too. Duke runs basketball. We do. The Olympics, Grand Hills at the Olympics, Adam Silver's over the NBA, the number of college basketball coaches, now the number of GMs, now the number of NBA players. You can't go anywhere in this universe of basketball that we know it from college on up and not see a Duke guy. Yeah. No, it's a... It's, uh... It's unbelievable. I've spoken about it a million times since I got here, but I didn't grow up a Duke fan, so I didn't really understood understand the magnitude of the brotherhood. And then you get here, it's it's very quick. Right. And I was gonna bring this up because uh, you mentioned Jabari, uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure you remember this term, but he was back here at K Academy. We watched both days, right? Do you remember, Jerm, the first day I guarded Jabari the whole time, and he was just kind of like a shooter out there that first day, and he clear like. I recognized the next day that he was just out there to get a run in, but I remember he was just kind of like doing spot shots, not really getting too active. And I, my dumb ass walked off the court thinking like, <laughs> oh man, like his knees have gotten to that point where he's, you know, whatever. And, uh, and the, next, the next day, oh my gosh, the next day he came back and the whole first day we guarded each other the whole time and he hadn't really put the ball on the ground. I think he was just, he was just letting us play, especially with the new guys. And the second day he came down and gave me a double cross left me like five feet behind him and then dunked off the wrong foot and then was just the best player in the gym by a mile for that whole day. And then I subbed out at the end. I'm sitting next to you ninth and I'm like, I'm telling you like yesterday, he like, what happened? Like he just decided he was gonna come in and like turn it on. And you were like, you have no idea. Like it's, he's the best freshman I've ever seen come through here. There's an argument. There's an argument that, I mean, fanfare wise, nobody's, I wanna say nobody, but as to date, the Zion Williamson craze was yeah. incredible. Number wise, oh my God! Like, <laughs> like coming in. No, people like to say Kyrie is where it starts as far as these fabulous freshmen that we have coming in. And Kay has always said that you know, Grant Hill would have been the fabulous freshman. Johnny Dawkins would have been the fabulous freshman mm -hmm. if they could leave. But you know, if I wanted to leave, whatever. But people like to say it's Kyrie that started that wave. Okay, I believe it started with. Yeah. Jabari. And just the way winning four, winning four championships in high school, just coming out, coming to Duke. And, and it's funny because the other day I watched the Kansas game that Duke played against Kansas in the United States that, that Duke lost. But just watching that game, he hit three straight threes. It was nuts. Yeah. And just to see him that size, no fear as a freshman, to have 30 here against Carolina at home, like he was, there's not too many freshmen that come, is coming here that's done what he's done number wise. I, I just remember being <laughs> and that quick, blown away that, that second day and feeling like an idiot. And I went straight home and watched his highlights. This is now like two months ago. But I just remember sitting next to you and I'm like standing there like looking like what? Like, what happened? like 24 hours ago, 
he was just shot a couple of threes Super. throughout pickup, and then today came and was like, Super I'm going to make sure these kids. Try and get it right. It was me. He's probably looking at me like, I'm going to make sure this kid remembers who I am. Ninth one other thing we wanted to ask you about, obviously you gave us the uh, the customized KDs last year, um, fed a history with Nike uh, and all that. Can you talk about your relationship there and, and how that's kind of altered your, you know, your career and what it's been about? Man, I, um, I was in at the Jumpman Classic watching Jabari in high school. And um, after which we went down to the family room in the Barclay. And I'm walking by, you know, going to the bathroom, doing something. And I hear somebody say, ninth, what? So I turn around and it was um, a guy by the name of Carlton DeBose. And Carlton DeBose is the, the head of EYB, Nike EYBL. And so he held up his phone and he was listening to a, a record of mine. And I was like, wow. He's like, man, you ought to come to Peace Jam. I'm like, okay. And so it took me three years, three summers to get there because I had so much to do in those summers. But I ended up going down and um, totally changed my idea of, of youth basketball at the time. And so I would go down, and, and then he asked me to become a life skills mentor for EYBL. Oh. Okay. And so now, now I'm going to Nike Academy that was at the time I started going was in Thousand Oaks, California. So I would go out there and meeting – you know, different guys. I think my first year I was there, I, it was the Cassius Stanley, Cole Anthony summer. And at that point, I'm thinking, I'm going in, this is what my teacher had on. At that point, I, I really don't, you know, people think that I do, but I really don't care where you go to school. I want you to be happy wherever you go. Right? Yeah. I'm not going to say, do, 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 like I'm not, do, it's, it's, I'm really going just to give you life skills and whatever, wherever you go, Stay long, don't just bounce or whatever. So um, that's when my relationship started with Nike, and it's still on. I just did, just went to Portland this summer, had Nike Academy again. Oh, yeah. um, I met Paolo at Nike Academy. I met so many kids at Nike Academy and just through the EYBL circuit. Um, so then, um, but in 2017 or 18, I was at um, Peace Jam, and I'm coming out of the Marriott. And KD is walking in. And so, but I see one of his, a member of his team first. He's saying, well, Knife, what's up? And I'm like, what's going on? It's like, man, KD want to meet you. Okay. So we started talking. And I didn't know at that time KD was a fan of my music. He, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And so we started talking over time after visiting his crib a couple times and trying to, you know, show he wanted to make beats. We talking about the, him coming by the studio in Los Angeles when I'm there. He finally called me in, one day and said, man, you want to, you want to do, I want, you want to do a sneaker with me. Well, what, what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, what does that mean? He's like, no, nah, I'm doing a producer pack and you one of the producers I chose um, to do uh, Nike. And I've been wearing Nike since forever, right? Yeah. I think next year, what, 2025 is the 40th year of the Air Jordan, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, I've been wearing Nike since I was nine. Yeah. And now I get to make one. This is incredible. So it was an eighteen month process, and we uh, eighteen months, eighteen months from from to completion, from your idea all the way to completion, and you know the colorways, everything I picked, and everything <clears throat> on the shoe that I picked, and one of the stipulations for me, I said I'll do this, but you got to give me. It's, I have to give them to a couple of teams, North Carolina Central, of course. Mm -hmm. The Carolina Dream, my girls' basketball program. It is a Nike program. It's not a UYBL program, but since I work with Nike. Uh, and um, do. Yeah. Very important to me. And so to be able to gift you guys with those shoes. And the most important thing about it for me is in the inner soul, in the inner tongue is my brother who passed away. His name, who passed away three years ago. Yeah. And he played basketball. He was recruited by Jim Valvano when he was 18. And I wanted his name still to live in basketball. So every time a kid wears that shoe, it's on a court somewhere. Yeah. So that was the biggest thing for me. And it's, it's still amazing to see kids. I saw kids at Peace Jam wearing them. I see kids that play in a, the Nike circuit on ESPN in high school wearing them. A couple of NBA players wore them. And Kevin Durant wore them one night. They played a, um, 
They played in Brooklyn. He was 21 for 25. He had 45 points. Is that, there we go. Were they playing uh, Orlando that night? They were playing Orlando that night. Gave Peter business. Uh, he gave my bad, my Paolo. Bad, my bad, Pete. My bad. Gave, gave, I saw Paolo after the game. <laughs> I remember but that. He had 45 <laughs> that night. He signed him. He gave him to me. Wow. So it was um, – Dream come true, man. All of this is a dream come true for me. I don't take nothing for granted. Yeah, that's incredibly special. Well, obviously, we we greatly appreciated them. So, met yeah. the world. And how about so you? You talked about uh, you know your freshman. You've obviously been to a few practices. What are your initial takes on this team? Oh my God, um, we have a chance to be one of the best shooting teams Duke has ever had. The 2001 team that the Duke had was an incredible shooting team. The 1998-99 team is one of the best teams we ever had. 16-0 in the ACC, only losing twice that season. Won in the Alaska shootout and the national championship. That's the only games that Coach Will Avery and them lost. Yeah. They only lost two games. This team has a chance. There's, there's no way as a guard in whether ACC or beyond, I want to chase Jeremy, Caleb, Jared, and Tyrese all night long. Yeah. There's just just the guard step. I don't want to chase that all night. Who wants to chase that? Mm -hmm. So, just from that standpoint, I believe, and and now we're we're a new era. Now we're, we're usually everybody's gone. Like five guys come in, five guys leave, right? For the guys to come back gives us something that we haven't had in a long time either. Mm. Like, four of the five come back after winning the ACC tournament, yeah. going undefeated at home. Like, that's that's heavy. Yeah. That's heavy. So, I think that, you know, I believe we have a shot every year. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this year is it's, it's a shot, you yeah. know, you know. Flip got new hips. Hey, you know what I mean? Who knows? But I mean, it's, it's, I think we have a shot and I'm excited. Jeremy, I'll toss it to you there too because uh, we just heard Nine talk about it before you coming back. Um, and obviously now you're a seasoned vet out there. Um, and you've been through a couple of different years here, your freshman year, tougher year with COVID, obviously, and all that. And you go to a Final Four, and then last year is a unique, different year as well. You know, what are you thinking about going into this year? You're returning your senior year. We got a ton of guys returning, like Nine just said. What's it take for us? I mean, I think the four, I mean, pretty much everybody coming back knows what it takes. I mean, but now that we have a mix of young guys and vets, now we, it's just, it's some, it's some I haven't been a part of for real. Um, but I mean, we just got to come in every day, obviously, consistent. I mean, I don't know how cliche that sounds just coming, <laughs> but like, really, we got a, we got a chance to be very special. I mean, with me, Tyrese, Mark, Flip coming back, we got the four freshmen. Um, it's just going to be very different. I mean, yeah. that's probably one of the best teams that I've been on here. Uh, I, I don't know. That 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 Final Four the team, final was, four that Final Two was, was crazy. Oh, but yeah. I think we're, we're just deeper than that team. Um, obviously, we don't have the size like what we had that on that team. But um, that team will be very special, yeah. very special. I mean, cliches are cliches for yeah. a reason. <laughs> um, all right, now a few quick, a couple quick hitters for you on Duke basketball. Uh, interested to get your take on um, best game watched in Cameron. The 2015 game against Carolina at home. When we came back, we were down, and we came back that game. Um, best game I ever watched in here. Uh, yeah. How much we're we down on? You know. We're down, we're down seven. Nine. Nine or nine, seven or nine with like a minute and something to go. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Oh, oh. We, got, we got to overtime. And um, Tyrese and Jaleel, I mean, uh, um, Tyus and uh, Jaleel yeah. showed out. Wow. Um, favorite Duke player to watch live? Oh, God. <laughs> it's a few. I like when, when, play, when players play – it's not just about power and finesse. It's, it's demoralizing. I like for you to demoralize somebody. And I've never seen a Duke player demoralize another team more than J.J. Redick. Yeah. <laughs> he had like 40 in Carolina. It's stupid. Like, it, yeah. 
He just demoralized. He's coming in the gym. Everybody's yelling at him. All this crazy stuff about his family. Blah 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 blah. And it's three after three after three after three after three after. It's like you couldn't stop him. It was nuts. So, um, JJ probably. Well, um, best Duke team ever. <sighs> Although they didn't win it, the 1998-99 team. There's a lot of people. Coach Will says that around here. A lot of people say that around here. Oh my god! Like, I say it again. Lost to Cincinnati in the Alaskan shootout by two points. Mm -hmm. Lost to um, Connecticut in the final because Ricky Moore had more than he was supposed to have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and lastly, all-time Duke starting five. Ah, here we go with this. Yeah, okay. Put you, put you on the spot here. <laughs> um, Leitner. Hill. Jason Williams. Yeah. Boy, this is tough. Mm, 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 mm. Um, Tatum. Yep. If Tatum... But if Tatum plays a two or three <laughs> and Leighton play, late plays five, I'm going with Jabari, man. I, it's Jabari. Yeah. Yeah, and Jabari going plays big. four. Huh? Going big. Yeah. Who are you, are you swapping anybody out there, Jim? I like his fire. I mean, you can't. You really, you really can't argue with that five. I ain't going to lie. You, can't really, you can't really can't argue with that. I mean, I might... If Tatum's at the three. I might put like Z in. Z was just, he was so crazy. He was yeah, so crazy yeah, here. Like, yeah. Z was so crazy. I might have to swap him out for somebody. Like, if Jabari comes out, it'll be Z. When so Tatum comes out, it'll be Z. He's either taking Tatum over or Jabari. But yeah. Leitner, Jason Williams, and Grant Hill stays for sure. For sure. Yeah. They stay. Yeah. All right. Um, just wrap up quickly with some Duke ACC basketball trivia. Uh, I'm a big trivia guy, so we've been throwing out some questions in the, at the end of these podcasts. And uh, um, I know you're obviously just a huge AC basketball fan in general, so expecting you to go to do pretty well in this. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, number one here. Which Duke player holds the AC record for most points scored in a single game? Jesus Christ. I can give you the number if you want. What's the number? It's 58. Score 58. Ugh. It's not recent. Very not no, recent. No, it can't be. Dawkins? Mm mm. It's big, right? Is this guy's a big? It's a big. It's a big. Oh, it's a big. It's not recent. Not even in 20. The no, no, not even recent, no. Oh. It's got to be late in it in. Yeah. Close. Okay. Danny Ferry. I assume that's close. Yeah. Um, he had 58 against. I don't know. <laughs> Do we know that, DB? That's a lot of points. Who do you have against? Oof. Um, we need the ACC then. Okay. <laughs> all right, number two here. Uh, the Blue Devils have seven of the past nine ACC Freshman of the Year awards. Can you name five? Paolo. Yep. Bagley. Yep. Jabari. Yep. Jaleel. Yep. Shoot. It's the easy one. The last one's easy. It's easy. Tatum? Mm. No. no. Easy. I said Paolo didn't. Think real recent. Oh, Zion. Yes. Yeah. Think even more recent. I said Paolo. Like very, even more like recent. recent. Like very recent. Like <laughs> a couple months ago. Like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got flip there. The only one you're missing. I think you got. Flip. Yeah, yeah. Flip. I think you got eight of those. Brandon Ingram's the only other one. Okay. Um, Number three, Duke leads the ACC with 22 all-time ACC tourney titles. UNC is second. Do you know who's third? I want to say not Virginia. Nope. Tourney titles. ACC tournament? Yes. Yeah. Um, definitely not NC State, though. I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? Is it NC State? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, if you count from. Yeah, yeah, it must have. They had to, man. From the Civil War, of course. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, all right, number four here. An ACC record, 18 Blue Devils have been named ACC Player of the Year. Can you name the last Duke player to win the award? Oh, um, 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 Trey Jones. Yes. Yeah. Here we go. Last one, number five. In 2012, Austin Rivers had a buzzer beater to win at UNC. Uh, in 2020, the Trey Jones and Wendell Moore hit buzzer beaters to win at UNC. Both of these, both of these games happened on the same date. Do you know the date? Oh my God. <laughs> okay, wait. So <laughs> we it's the beat, toughest question to date, probably on this podcast. We beat. Um, okay, so the Trey Jones, the Trey Jones, uh, Wendell Moore game was the first game that the meeting that season. So it was in February. Yes. Um, it's got to be the fifth or the seventh. Wow. It's the eighth. The eighth. Okay. Right there. You were the guy for that question. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, great job with that trivia. Um, this has been super fun. Like I mentioned, uh, it's, it's an honor to have you around and support us. And you mean the world to us as players. Uh, and uh, like you talked about here, I mean, a super serious part of the brotherhood that just benefits everybody and, um, you know, great to have you around, obviously, as a professor as well. I've been taking your class, but I know our guys rave about it in the locker room. So um, just appreciate you being here and Thanks, giving man. more insight into our our fans, and hopefully we can demoralize some teams for you this year. Absolutely. <laughs> thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate you. Right, Jerem, thanks for being on. Appreciate uh, it. Like I said, Team Music Guy. Team Music Guy. All right. Make on beats. Appreciate you all. We'll see you next week with the Brotherhood Podcast. Might, oh. oh, I might be the best rapper. He said... Uh, Marvin Bagley, uh, I think I'm. I think I got him for real. He cut out. Cut and out this concludes the Brotherhood podcast. <laughs> <laughs>